you know, come to the true land of the free Canada here today. So thank you all for your welcome. Um, and I'll just get started. So uh, we started these meetup groups about a year ago, and I think we have about 48 cities now worldwide. And it's actually exactly a year today when we started up the first New York group, so happy birthday to the meetups. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a short introduction to KDB Plus. So for those of you who know KDB Plus, I'm going to bore you for about five to ten minutes. Um, but I'm just interested in terms of a show of hands. How many people who have actually like programmed in KDB Plus before? KDB Plus or you? <laughs> <I'll say. laughs> um, how many are APL? Or former APL? Yay! Cool, cool. <laughs> How many are here for the free beer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll get started then. So just you know, just a little high-level slide about uh, KX Systems. So we're we've been in business since 1993, and we have offices in North America, Europe, and Asia. And so myself and Abby were based in our main sales office in Midtown Manhattan. And we're headquartered out of Palo Alto in California. And um, we have a pretty large user community, and obviously we have a pretty large user community in Toronto, which is almost feels like a spiritual home of KX in many ways, with the whole APL community and the Iversonian um, mindset up here. Um, and in terms of the industries that we work in, we're involved in primarily the financial markets industry, but in recent years we've now expanded into energy slash utilities, pharmaceuticals, uh, just general software firms, and also in the telecommunications as well. And um, so we've been primarily in financial service for about 20 plus years now at this point. So what is KDB Plus? Um, at a very, very high level, KDB Plus is an integrated columnar database and programming system. And what we have the ability to do is capture both streaming, real-time, and historical data in the one platform. So it's unlike a lot of systems out there where they either do one part or the other part. Um, so we kind of have this Lambda architecture kind of before the phrase became kind of sexy. Um, and the database comes in both a 32-bit and a 64-bit format. And just about one year ago now, we made actually the 32-bit uh, version free. So you can you know, download and run your own apps, you know, build your own next startup off it, etc., etc. And then the 64-bit version is actually licensed. So in terms of some of the features of KDB Plus, um, it's very, very lightweight, and um, so we can use you know, standard operating systems and hardware. So about 90 to 95 percent of our customers, I would say, would use you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but we do have a Solaris build, a Mac OS X build, and also if you're nuts, a Windows build as well. Um, and we run on you know, pretty much standard commodity hardware, so you know, anything from a Raspberry Pi all the way up to a supercomputer and everything in between. Um, and we're all about kind of in database analytics. And what I mean by that is you don't have to unnecessarily copy the data back and forth. So you have a lot of people nowadays who are you know writing queries or extracting data from a SQL database and then they're analyzing it in something like Python or Perl or R. Whereas with us, with the Q programming language, you have you know a rich analytic tool available to actually work directly on the data. So that helps in many ways. First of all, you have less of a memory footprint and less of a hardware footprint. Second of all, then, you've got less of an operational footprint because you only need one, two programmers rather than a Python programmer and a SQL programmer. And then also it just saves on your hardware costs as well because you've got much, much less hardware. And then also you get the really, really high performance because you're not necessarily copying data back and forth. And we also support compression as well. And we support compression from three different viewpoints. We support compression over uh, web sockets, which I'll discuss a little bit later. So that's if you're having data back and forth to a front-end visualization tool. And we support compression over IPC. So if you have one KDB Plus process talking over the wire to another KDB Plus process, you can actually you know, compress that data so you get you know, better network bandwidth. And then we also do on-disk compression as well. So that can help a lot in terms of saving for your storage costs. So you, know, you might have a petabyte worth of data, and then you can shrink it down to you know, a a small percentage of that size, depending on how you know compressible the data is. Um, and then in terms of parallelism, we support you know MapReduce. I mean, obviously the Hadoopsters out there kind of think that they've invented MapReduce, whereas it's just been around for years. Um, and we also have the ability to take advantage of all of the cores on a machine or all of the machines in a cluster. So you can really drive you know your machine to 100% as we've done before in many many projects that we've been involved in. 
And we also have a variety of different interfaces. So we have interfaces available for pretty much every pro um, you know, programming language out there. So you know, C, C++, Python, Perl, etc., etc. And we also have the WebSockets API that I mentioned earlier. And the nice thing about the WebSockets API now, in some of the later versions of KDB Plus, is that it can use uh, work as both a WebSocket client and a WebSocket server. So the WebSocket client then can be uh, really cool if you're doing stuff with like blockchain or Bitcoin and stuff like that, because that's kind of like a de facto protocol um, for those systems nowadays. So that's pretty cool. And um, so then, obviously, on top of KDB Plus, then we have the Q programming language, which is Arthur Whitney's brainchild. Um, and these are some of the features of the Q programming language. Uh, so first of all, it's interpreted. So you can just type it directly at the console, you get the results back straight away. So you know, it's instantaneous results, which results in you know, a lot more productivity, and you know, a lot better debugging, etc. Um, and we also are a functional programming language as well, so much like many other programming languages out there, you can create your own user-defined functions, or you can use the custom functions built into the Q language, so you can become very productive uh, straight away. And obviously, harkening back to the, the APL days, we are indeed an array and vector programming language, um, which means you know you effectively don't really have to write loops, so loops go away. So there's a famous website out there, nsl.com, from Stephen Apter, which the NSL means no stinking loops. Uh, so that's one of my favorite websites, just for the name alone. Um, and it's also a query language, so you can type SQL-like queries, uh, and then you can intersperse the, the query aspect with the functional aspect, so you can get a very, very powerful analytics straight out of the box. And one of the nice things we also have that really differentiates us from a lot of other databases out there is a time series aspect. So unlike a lot of SQL databases where they store you know, dates and times as you know, strings a lot of the time where it's really hard to do manipulation, KDB Plus has multiple different time series data types. So these are first class data types. So it means then you can cast back and forth between these data types and do really meaningful analytics and aggregations and rollups. And we support very, very low level um, timestamps, then to nanosecond timestamping and millisecond timestamping, month, minute, day, etc. So you can really do rollups and aggregations exceptionally fast and very, very uh, granular. And so this is just a sample of QQuery. So for those of you familiar with um, SQL, this isn't really too much of a jump. So we're just trying to show here you know, how easy it can be to do. So as you can see here, we're just doing a select open, which is going to be defined as the first price. So this would obviously in SQL be first price as open. So there's you know minor syntax change, but you know to most programmers this should be pretty logical what it actually is doing here. And then obviously we're doing it for the date in question, and then the symbol equals backtick AAPL. So the backtick is just the, the symbol upper, uh, the symbol data type in the Q language as opposed to a string or varchar in other languages. And then this example here is actually a comparison between Q versus SQL. So this is where you can see kind of where it veers uh, away from uh, standard SQL. So we can do aggregations, and, and by definition, Q data is going to be ordered. And so Arthur just said, well, why are we saying color three times in this query when we only need to say it once? Because by doing the by here, we're already doing the order and the group by, so why say it twice? Uh, and then we just move it inside the actual select statement. So as you can see, it's a lot terser, it's a, you know, a lot more compact form, and actually after a while it becomes much, much more intuitive rather than writing out these three lines of SQL. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, KDB Plus has you know, parallelization built in, and it effectively comes for free, and, and it's not like a lot of other programming languages where you have a very, very heavy, clunky, multi-threading API that almost abstracts away from what you're actually trying to do. You spend 90% of your time writing a multi-threaded code, whereas KDB Plus effectively takes care of that for you. And so in, in here in the first example, we're seeing just a single threaded one. So we're just writing some you know, complex function, and inside these parentheses here, and then we're passing into that a list of eight items, where we're just passing in eight large um, integers. And then literally to parallelize this, all we do is we just, do, instead of doing each, we just put a P in front of it for parallel each. So this is very, very powerful. So say if this is running on, say, an eight-core machine, and if we ran this, it would run almost linearly eight times faster. So effectively, you get parallelism out of the box for nothing. So it's not like a very, very clunky, heavy, multi-threaded API. And um, so 
so this is a, a typical sample architecture for a KDB Plus setup. I mean, a lot of you might be familiar with this if you've worked with KDB Plus before, but the, these kind of, you know, put together some of the different facets that you can do with the KDB Plus system. And so at the top here, you've got your data coming in. So this could be data coming from a, you know, a market exchange or from a smart meter or from, you know, some other IoT device, perhaps from a car or something like that. And so the data comes into the events engine, and in the finance world, it's, this is typically called a ticker plant. And so the first thing that this ticker plant or event engine does is it actually logs its messages down to disk. And so that means then that any of the downstream in-memory processes can then recover all of their data from this transaction log file. And this transaction log file would typically be residing on a very, very fast local disk, or sort of a state drive or DRAM SSD. <coughs> um, and the events engine or ticker plan works via pub sub. So the simplest example of a subscriber to the events engine would be the real-time database. And what the real-time database does is it's effectively a fire hose. It says, I want everything. Just give me everything you got. And so it's kind of a dumb process in many ways. It just takes the data and it just appends. It takes the data and appends. So the, the memory grows as it grows throughout the day or whatever you have this pre-configured for. This can be configured very easily. Typically in financial markets, what you have is you have this running throughout the trading day. Um, but what else you can do is you can actually do streaming queries. Um, so they can subscribe to the ticker plant and say, I only want to subscribe for trade data for this you know, bucket of stocks that I have in my portfolio because I don't care about anything else. So then what the streaming query engine will do is it will only get that small subset of the data, but it could be doing very, very complex analytics on the fly, such as uh, it could be calculating a VWAP or some sort of stock indicator or something like that. So it's slightly less memory intensive compared to the real-time database, which just grows larger and larger, but it's, um, it's a lot more computation intensive because obviously it's taking each you know, message by message and doing these calculations. Uh, and typically what happens then is that end of day or end of week or whatever the pre-configured interval is, the events engine sends a message to all of its downstream subscribers. And in the case of the real-time database, it actually just dumps all of its contents from in-memory down to disk into the historical database process. So typically then, if you're a trader then, for example, all of your hot data from the day will be residing in the real-time database in memory, so you'll get really, really fast in-memory performance. And then maybe the older data that you know isn't as critical in it from a time perspective or latency perspective, you know, will be residing on disk. But one of the nice things about the KDB Plus historical database is it has the advantage of and it can take advantage of the operating system file cache. Um, so that means then, say if we query for yesterday's data, for example, um, and then we go back and we query it again, it will likely be cached in memory, so then it will subsequently get in-memory performance. Uh, and this is just for free. KDB Plus is very, very lightweight. It only has one library dependency, and that's on glibz for compression. So it really works directly with the operating system. So as I said earlier, it's a very, very low footprint. And so uh, I'll finish off now, but uh, I'll just show you a few resource pages, you know, just to get you up to scratch on, on what you can do if you're pretty new to KDB Plus. And the first page I'll mention is our wiki page, which is um, code.kx.com. And if you go to that page, you'll see you know, reference material of all of the different functions. You'll see tutorials, and you'll see user-contributed code, and some articles, etc. So it's a, it's a very rich resource. There's a lot of information there, so it's well worth going to if you're, if you're pretty new, or even if you're an avid Q programmer and you're just thinking, okay, what does that function do again? I forget. And then we also have a community website, um, which will actually be getting a, uh, an upgrade in about a week or two, something like that. Um, but it's pretty cool. It's got like blogs, so you've got people who are you know committing code, and then we've got our Twitter feed, and then you can keep up to date of all of the different meetups. So if you're in another city, you can go and check out another KX meetup there. And so there's lots of cool stuff going on there. So that's more of a kind of a happening place for the developers. And then we also have um, two online forums. And we have one online forum on the list box, which is for commercially licensed users, which has about 1,300 plus members. And so if you post a question, you typically get an answer back in minutes. And, and then we also have a, a Google group, as you can see here. And the Google group is just publicly available for anybody to use. And, and that is well over 1,000 members now. And that's growing as, as the free 32-bit community is kind of you know, coming out, as it were. Um, and then recently, just within the last week, we started a GitHub page. 
And so we have quite a lot of projects now in GitHub that people have just committed, you know, where they've written just their own tools or their own open source code on top of KDB Plus. Uh, and just even within the last week since we announced it, we got another, like, another like five or six contributions to it. I mean, we, there's probably another few out there that we don't know about either. So if you know of any, just let us know and we'll add it to this. And um, so there's a lot of cool code there. It's all just free. Just download it and you can start playing around with it. So we're trying to promote the community and, and grow it a lot larger. Uh, so there's some really cool stuff there. So if you're, you know, starting working on a project, you, you know, oh, what will we do? How will we architect it? A lot of the code could already be here, so you don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. So we're encouraging people to go there and also to contribute as well. Uh, and then just a, a final interesting website, if you're a bit of a hardware nut, um, is the Stack Benchmarks. Um, so for those of you who aren't too familiar with Stack, they're the Security Technology Analysis Center. They're an independent benchmarking body for the financial technology um, sector. They're based just outside of Chicago. And what they do is they run a variety of different um, financial technology benchmarks. And the one which KX are involved in is called the M3, which is for historical tick databases. Uh, and the benchmark consists of 17 different analytic tests on databases of different size. So I think it's 1 terabytes, 10 terabytes, and maybe like 100 terabytes, I believe. Uh, and these you know, tests are like calculate the VWAP for you know, X number of symbols for Y number of months, or calculate the MDBO from the raw quote data, or write down all of the data for the day to disk. And it's pretty cool because we run against a variety of different hardware setups, so it's very good if you're trying to architect a system from a pure hardware perspective. So you see that we're working with different like versions of the Intel chipsets, so like the SSE instruction sets, you know, 2.1, 4.3, how, how much of X performance uh, can we get, or else if we're using a solid state drive, or if we're using a SAN or a NAS, or just normal spinning rust. <coughs> So it's pretty good if, if you like to get deep down into the weeds, and they're, they're pretty detailed reports, so they're well worth looking into if, if you're into the hardware side of things or, or just the system architecture side of things. Finally then, of course, is for those of you who are pretty new to KB+, you can go to um, kx.com and you can actually download the 32-bit version for free. It downloads in just a few seconds, it's just a few hundred kilobytes in size, um, which is about the same size as the source code as well, ironically enough, <laughs> for those of you who know Arthur. Um, and I think that's it. Um, so thank you very much. And I forget who the next speaker is. It's, it's not you. So, Karen. <laughs> so thank you very much. And if you have any questions, myself and Abby will be around all night tonight. And have a good night. And now I'm going to get a beer. So.